If you were going to make a top 10 list of things to do in your life or things that people find that they really want to do, here is one that I want to talk about that some people might not think about immediately put it on the list, but is actually number one. And that is we want to talk about seeing God one day. We want to talk about seeing God face to face. We want to talk about heaven a little bit in this particular series. In Revelation chapter 22, Revelation chapter 22, one thing said about heaven is found in verses 3 and 4. There shall no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his bondservants shall serve him. So there will be definitely things to do in heaven. Don't worry about getting bored. Then it says, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. The whole idea of seeing God face to face. That has to be the ultimate experience that one could ever experience in any sort of existence, whether this world or the world to come. I want to look at a couple of passages in the Old Testament that dealt with this as well. First of all, Psalm 63. Psalm 63 and in verse 1. Here's, that, here's how that particular passage reads. O God, Thou art my God, I shall seek Thee earnestly. My soul thirsts for Thee, my flesh yearns for Thee, in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I like that particular passage. Here are some who yearn for God's company, yearn for God's fellowship. In the book of Job, chapter 19, and this will be Job chapter 19, verse 25 through verse 27. Here's what Job said. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold and whom my eyes shall see and not another. My heart faints within me. I like that passage. First of all, Job knew that one day he would see God apart from his body, that there is more to our existence than just this body. Job understood that he had a soul or a spirit. And there may be a thought that Job understood that his body would be resurrected one day, that he would see God apart from the physical body. But there's something else here, and that is that he would see God and not another, that he's not just going to see some representative that God sends. It's not that he's simply going to see an angel or some sort of other spiritual being. He's going to see God himself. The fellowship that Job longs for, that Job knows exists out there, is a face-to-face -face relationship with God. Not a distant relationship, but one where you're actually with God, face-to-face. -face. Then he says, after he pondered this, he says, my heart faints within me that it's almost more than Job can endure at the time. It's almost more than he can conceive. Uh, it almost causes him to be a little bit lightheaded as far as when he ponders, when he ponders what the future holds for him of being actually able to see and be with the Creator Himself face to face. That has to be the ultimate thrill or the ultimate experience. I, I can't think of anything that could top that. You know, it, it's almost from the standpoint that Job thought such an idea just too wonderful, almost too amazing, magnificent for him to contemplate. Now, Jesus said the same thing, though. Jesus said in the book of Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they, they shall see God. Does it say they might see God? Or if they're lucky, they'll see God. They shall see God. So Jesus basically just said the same thing. Um, it's almost like Job said he was emotionally drained just thinking about this idea of seeing God face to face. What I, what I hope that we understand is that for the most part, this is something uh, that has been unheard of. No one's ever had this opportunity before. In the book of Exodus chapter 33 and of verse 20, Exodus 33, 20. God, uh, excuse me, Moses had wanted to see God. And 
Moses is told, I mean, he says in verse 18, I pray thee, show me thy glory. He wants to see God's majesty. Um, and then God says that he's going to allow all his goodness to pass before Moses. That is, and he's going to proclaim his attributes before Moses. But in verse 20, God is very clear to Moses. But he said, you cannot see my face. No man can see me and live. Now, oh, that's what was told Moses. Moses wanted to see God's glory, and apparently Moses wanted to see God in his natural state, God unrevealed, God's absolute majesty. And God gave him kind of a glimpse, a little bitty glimpse. But God says, you can't see my face. You would not be able to endure that sort of experience and live. In the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 6, we have a similar expression, 1 Timothy 6, 15 through 16, which he will bring about at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality, deathlessness, dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen, or can see. And I think it's understood that no man can see God as man is now. Uh, no man can see God in this earthly body. And right now, right now in this sort of particular time, era, no man is allowed to see God. But one day, one day, if you're right with God, you will be allowed to see Him. Uh, that, that sort of condition is going to end. One day, one day what has been not allowed, not allowed, and it's been never, never has been allowed. It will be allowed. Uh, Moses was not, was not allowed. As great as Moses was, Moses was not allowed to see God face to face. And when you look at 1 Timothy 6 where it says no man, that means Abraham was not allowed to see God face to face, or Isaiah, or David, or any of the prophets, or any of the apostles. None of the apostles were allowed to see God face to face either. So no one has yet been granted access to that glorious occasion. So, is this on your wish list? I want to go back to Psalm 27, Psalm 27 and in verse 4. It does kind of put everything else in perspective, doesn't it? Um, sometimes there are certain games that you play with little cards and a card would say... Uh, you know, what, what, what's the great experience there is or whatever. And, and people might say something like climbing Mount Everest or something like that. And people might say, well, that sounds pretty cool. But, but uh, climbing Mount Everest is nothing compared to seeing God face to face, is it? This just makes all earthly goals just pale in comparison. This really does kind of distance itself from everything else. Psalm 27, verse 4, David said, One thing I have asked, and from the Lord that I shall seek. David is saying that he's single-minded. Uh, there's only one thing he really wants from God. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now, I don't think that that means that David wanted to simply live in the tabernacle all his life because the temple was not built in his lifetime. But I don't think that really means that David would have wanted to live in the temple if it would have been around all his life either. I think the house of the Lord here is, is, is heaven itself, God's dwelling place. To behold the beauty of the Lord, and one writer said, is that not the essence of worship? The essence of worship is the desire to simply gaze upon God's beauty and God's glory. That's really the essence of worship. And to meditate in his temple, simply to see God, to ponder God, to contemplate God. That's what David wanted more than anything else. Now, you know, sometimes people might be kind of criticized for being like a, a single-issue candidate or a single-issue voter, but there's nothing wrong with being a single-issue worshiper. David says, this tops everything, this tops everything. Now, there's certainly other things that he would have liked in life, but this is the overriding, consuming desire, is to see God, uh, to be with God, to ponder God, and just to behold God and gaze upon His beauty. 
Uh, there was no substitute for that, and there was nothing greater than that. The one consuming passion. Well, I, I want you to ponder a little bit also, and I think really when you think about this, to see God, that is the ultimate, because um, when, you think about, when you think about heaven, as far as why people desire to go to heaven, uh, not everyone has the same motivation. Uh, some people want to go to heaven because they just don't want to go to hell. And so heaven is simply, well, I don't want to go to hell, so obviously that means I want to go to heaven. So heaven is, is nothing more than escape from hell for some people. Uh, some people are looking forward to rest. They think heaven is a place where they can nap a lot. They're looking forward to lots of sleep and rest. Uh, some think heaven is a place where you get to just do your favorite things all the time. Like if you love to fish, you get to fish all the time in heaven. If you love to hike and climb, you're getting to climb mountains all the time in heaven. Uh, if you like horses, you're getting to ride horses and care for them and kind of roam the range and things like that all the time in heaven. So some people are under the mistaken impression that heaven, you just kind of get to do whatever you want to do all the time as far as some earthly activity. Uh, some people think that in heaven kind of caters to a lot of sensual and carnal desires, that you have a lot of girlfriends in heaven. And others somehow think that in heaven they kind of get to play the role of God and rule and govern their own universe, that heaven's kind of a game. Heaven's kind of a big video game where they kind of build planets and uh, their own civilizations and things like that. And what the Bible points out is everything other than that. That's not what heaven is at all. But what makes heaven so wonderful is God. I hope you realize that that there would be no good reason to go to heaven if God was not there, and that there would be nothing wonderful about heaven if God was not its architect and desire. In uh, Psalm 17, uh, excuse me, um, in the book of John, Gospel of John, John 17 and verse 5, Jesus is about ready to go back to the Father. Uh, he is going to die and then uh, be resurrected. And he looks forward to going back and being with the Father and enjoying heavenly splendor because he had given that up. He had given that heavenly splendor up to come to this earth and live and die for our sins. He says, Now, Father, be, uh, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Um, what Jesus longs for, what Jesus longs for is not merely just being back with the Father in heaven again. What Jesus longs for is that relationship that he had had with the Father. That's what he really longs for. I want to look at Psalm 73, verse 25. Psalm 73, 25. Here's what the writer said, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And besides thee, I desire nothing on earth. That's a powerful passage. Who have I in heaven but thee? That is the only thing I'm seeking in heaven is God. Uh, yes, it's going, it's going to be nice being with people that I've known here. Uh, it is going to be nice being, with, being reunited with family members. Yeah. But the overriding goal is not to be with family members. The overriding goal is to be with God. I, I'm impressed that that's what the writer said. The writer, the writer doesn't say, well, I'm looking forward to the, the streets of gold, or I'm looking forward to the tree of life, or I'm looking forward to the paradise of God. No, it's, it's, I'm, it says the only reason I'm really striving for that is to be with God himself. That's what makes heaven so great, God's very presence, that God is there. And besides that, really nothing else matters. I know, I know sometimes I run into people and, and they balk at becoming a Christian because they have family members that never became a Christian, and, and, and they just have this idea of how could I ever enjoy heaven without maybe an aunt, an, aunt, an uncle, grandparent, parent, whatever, without them being there, and, and, and they're just missing something. 
It's not that a relative makes heaven so great, it's that God makes heaven so great. And I think people forget that if, if you're looking at God, you don't see anybody else in the picture. You don't see relatives and you don't see loved ones. Everyone else pales in comparison to God. Everyone else just fades from view when you're looking at God face to face. You don't see anything else. And I like the idea that he doesn't really desire anything else. Uh, I desire nothing on earth except a relationship with God. Now, that doesn't mean that he didn't enjoy things here. Obviously, the writer enjoyed things here on earth. But when push comes to shove, when push comes to shove, really the most important thing on earth, the overriding thing on earth, is to have a relationship with God. Because that's really what transforms all other relationships. Uh, that's, what, that's what makes our marriages so great, is God. Uh, that's what makes families great, God. That's what makes the blessings of this earth great, is God. Uh, without God, everything here kind of um, uh, loses its flavor, and you're really not able to enjoy it as you could. Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, For to me to live is Christ. That's the same idea that the writer in Psalm had said, and to die is gain. Uh, to live is Christ. To simply live is all about living for Christ. And when a Christian dies, they just gain. They just gain so much more because they're gaining a more intimate relationship with God. They're gaining an even closer relationship with God. And he says that in verse 23. I am hard-pressed from both directions. That is, I'm not, Paul said, I'm not sure whether I really want to stay here and keep on living or go and be with God because he says, having to desire to depart and be with Christ, he says, that's very, that's very, very better. But he says, but if I stay here, though, I can do a lot of things for Christ as far as fruitful labor and teaching people and saving people and etc. And he says, I'm just in a very difficult circumstance, which is good. He's not between a rock and a hard place. Rather, he's simply between good, two great options. One's good and one's better. That's all it is. It just, the next life, it's just so much better. But this life with God is good too. And so, uh, it's a good situation to be in. It's a good situation to be in that if you stay alive here, you still got a great marriage, you got great family, you got fruitful labor, you got a meaningful life. If you die, well, that's, that's better. That's even better. That's even better than the good life you already have as a Christian. I want to talk a little bit about here, though, the idea of if, um, you know, if God were to plant another Garden of Eden upon the earth, it would, it would still not be like the original. Because what made the Garden of Eden so special uh, is that God was there. That, that's what made it the true paradise. You'll see that in Genesis 3, verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The garden was a place where man had access to God, had fellowship with God, had a very intimate relationship with God. And because of that, because of that, there were no barriers. Before sin enters, there are no barriers between Adam and God, and there are no barriers between Adam and Eve. That had just this wonderful relationship. Genesis chapter 2, verse 5, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. There's no barriers there. Uh, it's it just an ideal, perfect relationship. There's nothing between them. Uh, there, are no, there are no secrets between them. There are no sins between them. There are no hard feelings between them. And that's this type of existence that existed between them and God. That's what made the garden so special. And, and the, reason, the reason I say that, you can even back that up by the fact that in our modern world, I mean, people have basically sought to make garden, gardens of Eden, and that is places that are very comfortable, like luxury resorts. I mean, luxury resorts are very beautiful places. Eden-like atmospheres, uh, amusement parks, places like Disneyland are wonderful places to go. Um, 
orderly and beautiful neighborhoods, sometimes gated communities. You go in there and everything's perfectly groomed and all the houses look really nice and everything looks in its place and all the cars are new and shiny and washed and it just kind of looks like this ideal land. But the same thing is true, you know, in a very similar way, um, a lot of the things that people put into their backyards are, are kind of an attempt to create a Eden-like atmosphere. Whether it's a spa, you buy a spa, or, or a sauna, or a beautiful backyard with a gazebo, and it's landscaped, and nice little lights that come on at night, or tiki torches, uh, beautiful decks with barbecues, and chaise lounges, and, and um, or, or when you go camping with your RV or recreational vehicle, or fifth wheel, and you pull out all the sorts of things that make that campground very comfortable and like a little home away from home and a paradise. And again, there's nothing wrong with any of that. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. But they are kind of man's attempt to regain what, what he had lost in the garden as far as comforts is concerned. In fact, many of those, many of those sort of earthly things are sold from the standpoint of uh, this will give you relaxation. A lot of spas. A lot of spas are sold that, uh, sold that way. They show a couple in a spa, they both have their heads leaning back, and they're relaxed. And, and the ad is, what a wonderful day after your hard day at work, you know, your hard door day with the thorns and the thistles and the weeds and things like that and all the things that make work stressful, and you're able to come home and settle into your own house, and in the backyard, you've got your spa there, and it's just the right temperature, and you're able just to settle into that and let all your cares go away. Well, a lot of those things are sold that way. Cars, RVs are sold that way. You're able to get in there and hit the open road and leave all your cares and worries behind. Now, all those things are nice. All those things are nice, but the problem is they cannot recreate Eden because there's, a, there's something missing. Eden was not primarily about earthly comforts. It had that, but Eden was primarily about a relationship with God. Adam and Eve were right with God, and that's why they had peace. And if, you, and if you're listening to this today, um, and you go like, man, I got, I got a lot of nice things in my life. Why don't I have peace in my life? Well, if God's missing, then that's a big piece of the puzzle that's missing from peace and harmony and uh, happiness. And what, so what, what I want to stress to you is that relationships, relationships, heaven is the ultimate relationship. Relationships matter. In fact, the most important things in this life are not things. They're relationships. Like the psalmist said, Psalm 73, 25. Let me quote that again. Beside you, I desire nothing on earth. That is, there's nothing more important to me than a relationship. A relationship with God is more important than wealth. It is more important than nice things. It's more important than a beautiful home. It's more important than anything else. Relationships trump everything. All right. You know, we know the psalmist. We know the psalmist that wrote that was not an ascetic. He was not someone who uh, simply said, I don't need anything and I don't like any earthly things. Of course, the Bible doesn't want us following that route. In Colossians chapter 2, there's the warning of submitting to things like do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with the using in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. We're told to avoid asceticism. To avoid all these ultra strict sort of diets and things like that, we're told that whatever God has created is good, and so we're told don't fall into that trap. Don't fall into that trap of having a dislike for God's earthly blessings. But what the writer is saying is that the central desires of his heart were for God. And in a sense, one writer said, in desiring other things, in reality, it's, what, it's God that we desire. Augustine called God the end of our desires. And he prayed, 
You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And I think that's true. I think that's very true, is that we're never going to find peace and happiness and rest until we have a relationship with God. So what that means is that you can, you can collect all sorts of things in this life, possessions and fame and status, but it's not going to ever give you any real and lasting joy. The key is lasting joy. It will give you joy, but it's not going to last. So I want to ask you a few questions here. I think you've already learned this lesson in looking at some other areas. That is, that, that without relationships and without that primary relationship with God, all the blessings of this life are rather stale and tasteless. For example, have you ever vacationed or traveled alone? It's not a whole lot of fun. Ask, ask married men, married men who have to go away on business trips, and typically most married men would much rather bring their wives. Because, yeah, they may go somewhere and have a nice hotel to stay in and have some nice meals, but that hotel room, even though it has all sorts of little neat things and accoutrements and comforts and things like that, is, is rather boring without another person. Uh, going out to eat at a very nice restaurant isn't, isn't much fun if you're just there all by yourself and you have no one to talk to and you have no one to share it with. A number of individuals who've, who have amassed a lot of wealth have asked themselves, what's the use of having a big mansion? What's the use of having nice cars and so on if the person that you're with does not even love you? That's hollow. In fact, history is filled with famous individuals who basically sacrificed a fortune or gave up a fortune in order to find love or in order to find a relationship. Houses. Houses are cold and food does not taste good without relationships. No fun to basically just see, sit and eat by yourself. It's no fun to even be in a huge mansion or a, a house that you would see on the street of dreams and you're the only one in it. That gets old real fast. And how much fun would you have if you went to Disneyland but you went all by yourself? I'm not, I don't know about you, but I've seen people be places all by themselves. They're at the beach all by themselves. Uh, they're in an exotic location all by themselves. Uh, they're, they're at some sort of event all by themselves. And I typically find that people, go to, people who go to neat things all by themselves end up doing a lot of people watching. Actually, a lot of times they'll, they'll watch other couples and probably think something like, boy, I sure wish I had someone to share this with. But the whole point is, the whole point is that the tremendous earthly blessings are hollow and stale if you don't have a relationship with anybody else. If you're all by yourself, the best meal, the best home, the best events get rather old. You have to have someone to share it with. And so, Paul said, Paul said, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be concerned or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. Fix yourself on that relationship who richly supplies us with all good things. And then he says, don't miss this, then he says, to enjoy. 1 Timothy 6, verse 7. Solomon basically said the same thing in Ecclesiastes 2, verse 25. And... I think it's a really, really important thing because um, I think a lot of people try to convince themselves I'm young and I'm healthy and I don't need anybody and I don't need God and I can, I can, be, and I can make myself happy with things. And Solomon says, and this man had all sorts of money. This guy had all sorts of money. He said, there is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and to tell himself that his labor is good. This also I've seen, it is from the hand of God, for who can eat and who can have enjoyment without Him? That's a great verse. Who can eat and who can have enjoyment without Him? I think Solomon is saying is, he had learned that by experience, is that you may have a lot, you may have all the food you want. I mean, Solomon, Solomon was never at a want for a good meal. I mean, he had all sorts of cooks and things like that. And he, you know, it could be midnight, he'd say, I want... You know, I want so-and-so, and they'd whipped it up for him. 
uh, and, and it's not that he was eating bread and water every day. I mean, he had a great, he could, anything he wanted, anything, you know, I want gazelle today. And it would have showed up at his table. Um, and yet Solomon understood that the, the power to enjoy earthly things comes from God too. The ability to enjoy earthly things. That is, the, the ability to really enjoy, enjoy them at their maximum capacity. I think that's one reason Jesus said the meek shall inherit the earth, because in the end, it is the faithful Christian who gets the most out of this life. Because only the faithful Christian can really, has, only the faithful Christian has reached a point where they can relax enough and not worry about things, where they can actually enjoy the blessings of today. They're not letting the worries of tomorrow eat up today's happiness. They can actually sit down and enjoy a meal and not worry about all sorts of other things because they're right with God. And in that sense, who can eat or who can have enjoyment without Him? And I think the, the, the challenge is you can't. You just can't. And so the whole thought there is, the whole thought there is, our ability to enjoy anything else basically is linked with our relationship with God is that one writer said, every other joy will be derivative, flowing from the fountain of our relationship with God. God is the source of all lesser goods, all secondary joys, which means like the joy of marriage, the joy of family, uh, the joy of good food, the joy of going to the beach the joy of a beautiful sunny day, which it is right now as we're filming this. Just a beautiful spring sunny day. All the ability to enjoy and appreciate all those things, all those secondary joys, those are all attached to God, our relationship with God. So, and you can't really, you can't really separate them from God for too long. Uh, as one artist said, flowers, flowers are beautiful for one reason. God's beautiful. Rainbows are stunning because God is stunning. Puppies are delightful because God is delightful. Sports are fun because God. God is an exciting God. Study is rewarding because God is rewarding. Work is fulfilling because God is fulfilling. All those things, all those things attach themselves to that relationship with God. And I would just challenge you on that point. If you're not a Christian right now and you're kind of pondering that, is that right, Marty? Is that really true? I think it is. Work is more rewarding and fulfilling when God is in your life because all of a sudden your life has meaning and purpose. All of a sudden you've got something a lot bigger in your life. All of a sudden work is not just going to get a paycheck and buy groceries. All of a sudden work is far more than that. Work, work is going to honor God. Work is going so that you also have a little bit of money in the bank to help somebody in need. Work has a lot bigger picture out there. Recreation. Recreation is a lot more fun when God is in your life because first of all, first of all, I think you appreciate nature a lot more when you understand who, who made it. If you just feel that nature is a product of an accident, I think it's, it's a little bit more difficult to appreciate nature when you think, well, this is a fluke. This is kind of a beautiful fluke. But you, when you understand that what you're looking at is God's fingerprints, God, God's handprints, what you're looking at is you're looking at something the Creator made. You're studying God's thoughts after Him, and all of a sudden you have a new appreciation for the beauty of this world, that everything you look at is something God designed with His wisdom. And, and, and uh, that, to me, I think is impressive. Not only that, but recreation is more fulfilling because you already feel good about yourself. You can go out and recreate, but if you're not right with God, if you're not living right, there's still some guilt there. You, it's almost like you feel like you haven't earned the right to play yet. Again, I always have a rule of thumb, work first, play later. I always find when, my, when I work first and play later, later, I enjoy my play a lot more because, number one, I feel that I have somewhat earned it. And that is a, it's a reward. And I don't have to worry about like, oh, I got I to gotta finish here because I got to get back to work. I already did my work. I already did my work. It's a lot easier to enjoy things when you feel good about yourself, that you're right. That you're right with the universe, that you're right with the God. Not only that, but recreation is more fulfilling when you're right with God because typically you're recreating with other people who might be right with God too. 
And so you don't have to worry about things like profanity and, and, and bad attitudes and things like that. Far more enjoyable to play basketball with a group of Christian men than with a group of men of the world who can't control their anger and things like that. And material possessions are appreciated because you realize that what I have here, this possession that I have, I'm not going to have forever. All right, this, this possession is not going to last forever, and I'm not going to last forever. It, 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 there's a greater urgency to simply enjoy what I have now. And you know what? If I lost it, I'd still be the same person. And so the idea that I'm going to keep some possession all locked up and never look at it, no one let anyone touch it, is rather silly. There's no use of having a possession like that, that you never look at or touch or whatever. My recommendation, it just this is my opinion in life, is don't ever buy or get anything that you're not going to be able to use. Something that is so, something that you're going to kind of tuck away and almost keep as a museum piece that no one's allowed to touch or sit on. There's not a whole lot of fun in having something like that. I mean, whatever you have, whatever you have, and I'm not saying you can't have nice things, but whatever things that you have, make sure it's something that you would also be willing to use. You're not going to really enjoy it if you never use it. And the Christian, the Christian isn't afraid to use things because that's what it's here for. It's not here to be kept as a museum piece. And love between a husband and a wife is far more enriching when both are right with God because both have been treating each other right. It's far easier to have romance in your marriage when both of you have been acting like Christians. You've been backing up one another. You've been treating each other right. You've been treating each other unselfishly. You, you, you've been doing things for one another. You've been basically you've been trying to outdo one another in kindness and love. And, and you're thinking about the other person. You're not wrapped up in yourselves. You betcha. You betcha. When people are living unselfishly, you betcha there's more happiness in a marriage. You betcha there's more spice in a marriage when people are living right. Hey, when they're not, Romance goes out the door. You know, when you're both manipulating one another and you're selfish and you say hurtful things to one another, don't be surprised if that's not a very enjoyable relationship. You know, the common mistake that a lot of people make is they're like a child who gets a present from a loving father or mother and becomes so consumed by the gift itself that they forget about the love of the parent. That's a mistake we make. Maybe you've made that mistake. Maybe you have become so preoccupied with the presence God has given you that you forgot about Him in the process. I need to correct that. God doesn't want to be replaced. I mean, God doesn't want to be depreciated. God doesn't want to be forgotten. God wants to be recognized as the source, James 1.17, the source of the good things in your life. So don't be like the child who grabs the gift from the parent and runs out to the room and never says thank you and never, want, never acknowledges the parent. The most important thing there is the relationship. Whatever gifts that you've been given in life are from a God who loves you. James 1.17, as I said. And so don't forget about Him. Those gifts will never make you happy. Those gifts are kind of cold on their own and those gifts will wear out. But remember, the most important thing is that relationship with Him. Now, you know what the good news is? The good news is two things. Number one, that while I'm alive, I get to enjoy God's daily blessings. That's 1 Timothy 4.4. 4. Everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. So God says, enjoy the good, wholesome things that it gives you, the sunshine and the blessings and relationships and parents and marriage and, and even the possessions of life. Enjoy those things. Enjoy those things and appreciate those gifts. So that's one thing I get to do. And, so, and you get to do other things like water rafting and skydiving, extreme sports or Whatever else like that, you can do those things too, all right? And then just enjoy the things of this world that are wholesome. But at the same time, I get to practice now. I get to practice a little bit of being in heaven. And what I mean by that is, as I'm enjoying these things that God has given me, 
God also wants me to do this, Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of His grace. God wants me to practice a little bit for the future as far as my relationship with Him. God wants me to start drawing near now and start developing that intimate relationship that will only get far greater in the next life. And so, talk about the best of both worlds. God says, it's okay for me to enjoy the wholesome blessings of this life. And I need to be appreciative, appreciative for those things. And also, I need to seek Him. I need to seek Him earnestly and develop a relationship with Him. Because He wants to have a relationship with you. The Bible says to be right with God, to get a relationship with God, that you need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you, and you believe that by hearing the gospel message. Romans 10, 17, John 3, 16. Uh, you can't have a relationship with God, though, and be, and, 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 and be selfish and be doing what you want to do. Okay? You can't have a relationship with God and remain in rebellion to Him. You've got to make a choice. Either you've got to hold on to your sin and forfeit God, or you've got to let go of your sin and you get God. So you have to repent. Acts 2.38 And then, who would not be willing to confess that Jesus is the Lord? Romans 10, 9 and 10. And then be baptized, immersed in water, for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 22, verse 16. That's how you develop, that's how you enter into a relationship with God. Now that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. That's not, that's not the beginning and the end. Upon your baptism, you are a Christian, you are saved, you are forgiven. God now expects you to be faithful to Him, to be a true friend, to be loyal to Him, which means that you follow His Word. You follow the teachings of His Son, Jesus Christ, not just now and then, but you follow them consistently. You follow them daily. Along with that, God expects you to be a member of a local congregation, a local church that is teaching God's truth, that is following the Bible, Hebrews chapter 10, 24, and 25. If we can assist you in any way, if you have any other questions about that or any other thing, feel free to give us a call. My name is Mark. You can reach me at 503-644-9017. You can see us on the web, and you can email us from that website at www.beavernandchurchofchrist.net. Thank you.